Welcome everyone to the International Women's Writing Guild Digital Village. We're really happy this afternoon, actually in my time and Pacific time, the United States, it's afternoon. Um, we are welcoming you from around the world today. And it is with great pleasure that I'm going to be interviewing Patricia Bell Scott. Patricia Bell Scott is Professor Emerita of Women's Studies and Human Development and Family Science at the University of Georgia. Her most recent book, The Firebrand and the First Lady, Portrait of a Friendship, Polly Murray, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Struggle for Social Justice, is a groundbreaking biography, two decades in the works, that tells the story of how a brilliant writer turned activist, who was the granddaughter of a mixed race slave, and the First Lady of the United States, whose ancestry gave her membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution, forged an enduring friendship that changed each of their lives, enriched the conversation about race, and added vital fuel to the movement for human rights in America. Polly Murray became a lawyer, civil women, a civil and women's rights pioneer, and the first African-American woman to be ordained as an Episcopal priest, despite the discrimination she faced because of her race, sex, and sexuality. Eleanor Roosevelt, the niece of Theodore Roosevelt and the wife of Franklin D. Roosevelt, became a diplomat and human rights internationalist in her own right. Drawing on letters, journals, diaries, published and unpublished manuscripts and interviews, Patricia Bell Scott presents the first close-up portrait of this evolving friendship and how it was sustained over time, what each gave to the other and how their friendship changed the cause of social justice. The Firebrand and the First Lady won the Lillian Smith Book Award, was named Best Adult Nonfiction Book of the Year by the American Library, and was shortlisted for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It was long listed for the National Book Award. Patricia's previous books include Life Notes, Personal Writings by Contemporary Black Women, Flat-Footed Truths, Telling Black Women's Lives, and Double Stitch, Black Women Write About Mothers and Daughters, which won the Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Book Prize. A former, former contributing editor to Ms. Magazine, she's also co-founder of the National Women's Studies Association. I might add that she recently addressed the American Bar Association in Washington, D.C., where she was introduced by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and where she was one of only two individuals, not lawyers, who have ever been given this honor. The other individual was Gloria Steinem. Pat, I am so delighted to have you here today, and just so excited by this book and what you've done with it. And I was fortunate enough to, get to meet you last summer at our summer conference, uh, where we were both in Kelly DeMar's playwriting class as you were trying to turn the firebrand and the lady into, into a play. So I'd like to start by just talking a little bit about how you got interested in this topic in the first place and how this book evolved over this 20 year period. Thank you so much for that warm uh, introduction, Dixie. Um, and uh, I am so uh, delighted to be here in this webinar for IWWG. As I said to you last summer, I have belonged to the Guild for many years, but last summer was my first time attending. This is a book that I feel that I was called to do. It was not something that I had planned. Um, I was in the midst of another project and got a re encouraging letter from Polly Murray in the fall of 1983 about work that I was already doing. And I was excited about the letter because I knew who she was, but was also curious about a number of the people she mentioned in the letter. She said that she was working furiously to finish her autobiography. She also said that she thought it was important for me to get to know some of, I think the exact words were, uh, you need to know some of the veterans of the battle on whose shoulders you stand. Mm -hmm. And um, initially, that felt like she was pointing her finger in my face. And indeed she was, she was pointing her finger at me, but also pointing me in a direction. And I felt just a little uneasy. I think my shoulders sort of moved toward my ears when I heard that, but I filed the letter away, uh, feeling good about the fact that she had noticed the work I was doing and was very complimentary. But little did I know that in 18 months she would be dead. Mm. She died within 18 months of pancreatic cancer. And 
I was devastated. I did not know at the time that she had written that letter that she was ill. She was dying of pancreatic cancer. Uh, I did not know that her mention of Eleanor Roosevelt as one of her mentors and friends was deliberately designed to entice me to look further. Because I was in the midst of other things and only I think I had just turned about 31 when she when I received that letter, I went on my way to finish some other things. And so it was about nine years after that letter, which continued to bother me. I would I would replay it and take it out and look at it from time to time and think, what did she mean? What did she say? And so when I was on a research trip at the Schlesinger Library, nine years later, I decided to take a break from the project that I was working on and I requested, made a request of the archivist to look in the file for the Pauli Murray Eleanor Roosevelt correspondence. And I read the first, the letters in the first file. And it was, it, it was like the world shook for me because I immediately felt drawn in. I got up from reading the first letter. I had to walk around and I came back to it and I just calmly closed the file on the other work I was doing. And I turned to that correspondence and I felt as if I knew exactly what I was supposed to be doing. And it is so uh, wonderful that I did not know how huge the project was no. or that I would find myself working on it for nearly 20 years. Uh, I had not written a biography before. Uh, so it was, you hear the, the old notion, ignorance is bliss. In this case, it was because if someone had said to me, that this work is going to take you to seven archives, at least seven archives. You're going to be interviewing people who are in their mid to late 80s, all the way to people who are your age, who have had some sort of encounter with Pauli Murray, that um, I am going to be looking at history for the almost all of the past century, looking at women's rights, human human rights, looking uh, at issues of sexuality, uh, all kinds of issues of uh, women's role and women's uh, involvement in the church, because uh, readers who encountered this book will discover that wherever there was injustice, Holly was there. Whether it was in the workplace, whether it was in the church, uh, whether it was in the women's movement, whether or not it was in the uh, movement for civil rights, Polly was there calling out the truth. Uh, she never rested. She was forever encouraging uh, people to um, to call on their better selves and to and to look at, at, at to, to take a look at, at how you were dealing with issues of justice. I'd like to say that this was someone who seemed to be inherently called to look at issues of in, inequality. She was barely six years old when she filed her first complaint against discrimination over the breakfast table. Uh, her grand, her, her, her adopted mother was, was um, serving pancakes and Polly noticed that her grandfather got one pancake and she got three pancakes and she only got one. And so she turned to her aunt Paul, Pauline who had become a, her adoptive mother and said, Aunt Pauline, why does grandfather get three pancakes and I only one? And she referred to that in her memoir as her first official discrimination complaint. Exactly. And how do you tell a precocious child uh, <laughs> why she should only have one pancake and her grandfather have three? In her mind, they were privileging age and perhaps sex. He's the fact that he was male and she was calling them out. I love it. I just love it. Yeah, age discrimination, all when you're five, you know, age discrimination is a primary topic. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really curious. Polly is not in and of herself, I think, up until now, a very well known individual, but she appears to have played a remarkable role in terms of her involvement in so many different issues related to 
civil, human, and women's rights. How did you find out about her first? How did you learn about her? Well, I learned about Polly because I was involved in the women's study movement, studies movement in the early days. And Polly did research on women. She started out as a labor activist and made early contributions to civil and women's rights history. So I discovered her from doing work on history. And then we seemed to begin to cross paths because she was always looking at the younger people coming behind her. So that, uh, as I said, she wrote me about my work. Um, I also learned that there were other people who were involved in issues that I was concerned about and working in who knew her. So that she seemed to be in the background of of a lot of, of concerns that I had. And, and so I discovered her. It wasn't really though, until I began to take a look at her, her life that I realized how central she had been to issues of justice throughout the past century. And her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, I'm assuming that, that was not something that was necessarily really well known outside of the immediate circles in which they worked? Or was it? Is it something that we just haven't paid a lot of attention to until now? Well, it's, it's interesting. It seems as if it wasn't hidden. Uh, Eleanor talked publicly about Polly as one of her friends, but there has been historically this focus in African-American women's and just American history in general on on institutions, and Polly was a very impatient person, even though she was central to the NAACP's work uh, in um, fighting, uh, fighting against uh, segregation in the courts. She was not one who was patient enough to work with the guys so that she would make her contribution, and then when she felt like she had run up against um, a block, she would move forward in other ways. So um, she's not someone who shows up in, in the institutional histories as an official. She didn't hold elective office, though Thurgood Marshall and the men who ran the NAACP Legal Defense Fund relied on her writings for their work with the ground breaking Brown decision. She uh, was one of the co-founders of NOW. Polly and um, Betty Friedan wrote the charter and the founding documents for now together. But Polly was someone who found bureaucracies very frustrating. They moved very slowly. She was also very impatient with people who couldn't move and think as quickly as she did. So she would make her her contributions and then she would move forward. And for that reason, because history tends to have a focus on institutional leaders, she up until recently has appeared primarily in the footnotes. Uh, but part of my mission has been to bring her into the light. Well, this woman was not ego driven at all. I mean, yeah. she did not seek the limelight from all appearances. Um, probably found herself most effective in working behind the scenes, particularly as an African-American woman at that time, yes? Yes, yes, yes. In, in fact, she preferred, this, was, this is also, I think, another reason why she doesn't show up as much in uh, previous history works, is she detested bureaucracies and she really enjoyed working alone. Polly was first and foremost a writer. She used to say uh, to friends and colleagues that she was drawn into activism by the uh, call of the time. She would very much like to have spent her life writing uh, fiction, poetry, mm -hmm. uh, nonfiction, but the call of the moment uh, drew her into civil rights. And so that is why Primarily, she's known as an activist, as a lawyer. Uh, what sometimes gets lost, which is what I try to attend to in the book by including excerpts from her poetry and her other writings, is that writing was her first love. Wow. 
how amazing this woman is and this story is. And the book is remarkable. It's such a good read. I want to let our audience know that if they have questions for you, they can go into the Q&A on their screens. Um, depending on their device, it may be in the upper right-hand corner or down below. But just clicking on that, you can write in your questions. And I believe Marge Hahn is working behind the scenes for us today, and she'll bring those questions to our attention. In the meantime, I know from our previous conversations that you actually wrote three different versions of this book. You were really struggling to find your voice and the best way to convey this material um, and to convey Polly's voice and Eleanor's voices through your, this book. I'm sure that a lot of our audience, especially those who write nonfiction, face similar struggles. Um, how did you finally find your way to the remarkable piece of, of writing that you've done here? Well. As you said, Dixie, there were uh, three different versions. The first version of this book was primarily a collection of the letters. And that is initially how I conceived the book as a collection of letters that would be linked by, um, by exploratory, explanatory text. Mm -hmm. And um, when I finished that, and I, mean, and I finished that, I. But what I felt after it was done was that it was incomplete, it was fragmented, that there was, there was backstory that needed to be told. Uh, for example, there were times when the letter, uh, the letterhead for um, Polly's correspondence uh, did not did not reveal where she really was. Like there was one time when she was writing Eleanor Roosevelt from her hospital bed, but she used her office stationery to, I think, conceal the fact that she was in the hospital, actually in the psychiatric ward. She had had a, an emotional breakdown from fatigue and she also suffered from uh, a thyroid disorder, which resulted in mood swings. And then she had a, uh, she was dealing also with, with uh, sexual identity issues. Mm -hmm. So instead of using anything that betrayed where she was, she used office letterhead, which would lead one to think that she was actually writing this letter from her office, which she was not. And it seemed to me to be important to let readers know um, because it was important in their friendship that over time, what, what you see is that Polly begins to reveal her truest self to the point that she no longer conceals what she's going through to, there's a letter in the book where she talks to Eleanor about uh, the, a family history of illness, about the fact that she's had a brother who's, who had been lobotomized, mm -hmm. about she, the fact that she'd had a sibling, two siblings, I believe, who had been hospitalized for mood disorder issues. It seems as if thyroid disease ran in the family so that there was a history of mood disorders. Her father had had um, an issue with mood disorders and had been murdered in a mental hospital where he had been committed. And the friendship reaches a point over time where we see that Pauly reveals her deepest um, concerns and issues about which she is very circumspect at the very beginning of the relationship. And so the nature of the correspondence um, is linked to the, the, the letterhead she uses. And I thought, I want to be able to explain that to readers. So I needed to be able to do that. I also uh, wanted to be able to cast them on a larger historical map. And so sometimes what that meant is that I needed to give them, the reader, a fuller history of the context for these letters. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, when Eleanor is writing Polly about some of her concerns about um, what's happening around war issues, it's important for readers to know how often and how frequently Eleanor is visiting troops and that she, every time she goes to visit troops, she, she seeks out the black troops and that she does, she's really bold in her approaches to them. There's a scene in the book that I recount where she walks up to um, a black uh, 
man in the army who is at a USO canteen and the canteen, remember the army is segregated, the military is segregated. And he obviously is uh, despondent, feeling very much alone. This is in the Pacific and he's eating a, co a comb of ice cream and Eleanor walks up to him and takes and asks him if she can taste his ice cream. And he doesn't respond and she takes it out of his hand and she licks it and she gives it back to him. Now they're white officers and white uh, army uh, mates of this man looking while she's doing this. And you can imagine that you could hear a pin drop while, she, while this is happening. Uh, but this is not something Eleanor talks about in her letters to Pauly, but it happens at the same time that they are discussing what's happening with the war and Pauly's uh, very uh, agitated because she really doesn't want the president uh, to President Roosevelt to put race issues on the back burner right. because he feels like war, the war issue must be at the forefront. And so it's important to me to let readers know that Eleanor is doing everything she can behind the scenes to keep the issue of race and discrimination at the forefront, even if what she does is make is, is take personal acts such as these to ease the feeling of isolation and uncomfortableness of black troops. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt is such a well-known figure and there's been so much written about her. I think one of the most interesting things about this book is that one can understand how she might have an influence on a young activist. What I think is remarkable is the influence the young activist has on her. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and uh, that I think is, that issue is something that was really important to me because Eleanor has a number of young friends who are Pauly's age mates who do get it, who have gotten attention in previous histories. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue that part of the reason that some of them have gotten attention is because they have been men of position. They have been primarily white men and they have been primarily white men who have had positions in, in institutions and organizations. And Pauly uh, was never an officer in the NAACP or an officer in any of the youth activist uh, groups. However, I would argue that the prodding and the discussions, the difficult dialogues she had with Eleanor Roosevelt moved the first lady uh, in ways that allow us to see her as this uh, progressive woman that we've come to identify her as. For example, when they first exchanged letters in 1938 and 39, Polly is urging the president and Eleanor Roosevelt to help her enroll at the University of North Carolina, which does not admit black people. And Eleanor's, the president really doesn't respond directly. However, the first lady does respond rather promptly. And she says to Pauly, you know, I, I sympathize with you. I'm paraphrasing, I sympathize with you, but as long as these laws, meaning the segregation, these laws requiring segregation are on the books, uh, we have to obey them. We have to fight patiently within the system. Now, Polly was very happy because this was the first letter she received from the first lady. She was very happy to get this response. However, it was not advice that she would heed. She was not about to be patient. She was not about to fight simply within the system. She was going to protest. Um, and so what we see at the beginning is a friendship that is contentious. They, they share a different positions on how to deal with the issue of segregation as encoded in the American legal system. That's in the late 1930s when they meet. By the time that Eleanor Roosevelt dies in 1962, she is doing exactly what she cautioned Polly against doing. She is disobeying segregation laws. She is willing to identify herself with young 
civil rights uh, protesters in the South. She is organizing and helping to organize people who are planning to um, protest um, de facto and legal segregation. So we see her move toward Polly. And what I try to demonstrate in the book is that Polly moves a little toward the center because Eleanor says you got to work within the system. Polly gets to the point where she moves from voting from the socialist candidate in her first presidential election in 1932 to becoming a registered Democrat, though she always described herself as independent-minded uh, <laughs> Democrat. And then we see Eleanor Roosevelt moving from a very cautious Democrat to the more progressive, clearly left of center uh, Democrat. So they, what I say is they converge toward each other over time. And I think it is the result of this extended dialogue they have, very open, sometimes very uh, candid and difficult uh, conversation about issues of race and issues of discrimination. You know, I think what's wonderful about this book is you have provided amazing historical context. Um, you have traced where these people were in their lives at the time they were writing to each other, the kinds of public events that each were involved in. Um, but you've kept it very readable, very accessible. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your writing process and your history as a writer. I know that when we spoke earlier, one of the things we talked about is that while you don't teach writing per se, or didn't when you were uh, not retired, you were not teaching writing per se, you said that journaling was something that you required of your students and that you put a, an extremely high emphasis on writing. Um, but it sounds as though it's not just academic writing. It sounds as though it's reflective writing. Can you, again, talk a little bit about that and how it's played out in your own life as well as in your teaching? I have been, I guess I would, I, I confess to being a, an obsessive journal keeper. <laughs> and I've probably, I've, I've done this since my late 20s, early 30s. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, there is, uh, there, there are two things that I have to do to get ready to start the day, to greet the day. One of them is some kind of meditation that usually includes some movement. It might be yoga. But when I'm pressed for time and I can't do that, I simply have to write in my journal. Even if all I can write is, I am really rushed today and I'm not going to be able to write more than this in my journal. But it is my way of sort of aligning myself to greet the world. And um, even though I'm a trained academic and had a 30 year career in the academy, it is my women's studies training that has encouraged me to think about how important it is that the research and the work that I do be accessible to people, in particular women. Um, I did a textbook years ago uh, with two other women and one of the goals of that textbook was to uh, figure out a way to translate the work that we were doing in such a way that we would, and this may sound grandiose, but we really meant it, uh, save women's lives. And um, so for me, a work, even as an academic, um, work that is inaccessible, that, re that, that it makes it really difficult for people to understand, um, doesn't please me very much. And so as I was teaching myself to do this biography, um, I, I had the advantage of, of studying Polly's writing, and she is quite accessible, and reading her journals and thinking about what she wanted to do in terms of reaching a broad audience. And then also I had the advantage of being able to read Eleanor Roosevelt's writing and she was she had a public um diary i would call my day really was a public diary sure. very accessible um some people would say simplistic but for me 
the accessibility issue was just really important. And so I always work with a group of writers. I belonged to a writer's group while I was working on this. And uh, one of the people in the group was an academic, but they, they were writing in different genres. So um, two of them were um, mystery writers. One was a memoirist. Um, and I was working on this biography project. I also think the fact that I am also, my favorite reading genre is mystery. And I also think that that helped because in many ways, um, I wanted to write this in such a way that readers felt like it was a journey and that we were trying to solve this mystery of where this friendship was going. Uh, so I think, I think there were, there were several uh, uh, factors that contributed to the way in which this worked. And then also, I like to, I like to try to allow the, the process, the, the structure, I should say, the architecture of the work to emerge organically, which is why there were three different versions of it. You know, I finished the first version and it didn't feel right. I finished the second version and that didn't satisfy me. And then the third version I felt, uh, was engaging and I can tell you that one of the things that really brought me to tears was when my mother told me uh, after having read the book how much she enjoyed it and um, how there were various points in the book when she said she got teary-eyed. She cried when Eleanor Roosevelt died. Uh, she cried when one of Paul's, Paulie's last aunt died, and then she cried at the end of the book. And my mother um, is African American, working class, not college educated. She's a reader. She and I read mysteries together. Um, but she epitomized the kind of person that I wanted to feel comfortable with this book in her hand, you know, a thinking woman, someone who likes to read and is curious. So um, I was very uh, happy when the American Library Association named the book, uh, when the book won their uh, best adult nonfiction book, because that's not, I mean, the you know, they're clearly, um, it's an important organization, but the focus is not on the academy. Now, what this means is that students enjoy the book, you know, undergraduates uh, and high school students are enjoying it. So broad as possible audience was what I wanted for, for these two, for this story. You know, you've done homage to both Polly and Eleanor, I think in this. Um, and I kind of get, teary as I start thinking about it myself in that um, the foundation of um, the civil rights movement, we think of, I, th I think we visualize the marches, we visualize the, the public dissent, we visualize the, the incredible bravery that it took so many people to take the actions that they took. But another aspect of social justice is what you are doing with this book, which is writing about it and making it accessible through story, capturing people's imaginations about the real human beings who are behind these marches, who are behind the public dissent, who are fighting for things that they really strongly believe in. You mentioned that social justice has been a part of what you've always cared about and believed in. Can you talk a little bit about how your writing complements that or how your writing becomes a channel for your social justice commitment. Wow. Um, one of the ways in which, I think that one of the most important steps that we can take in terms of empowering people to um, take control of their lives is to teach them to read and write. And I see journalism, I've, I'm sorry, I mean journaling as one tool to do that. And because there's something about, um, I, I'm, I'm old fashioned, I'm one of those people who journals with the pen in my hand. Uh, I, I have friends who, who, who keep their journal on, the, on their computers, but there's something about seeing the word take shape on the page 
that is empowering. So that I find uh, the journal as just a wonderful tool in terms of the first step toward self-empowerment. And I find that to be really important when you're working with or concerned about empowering people who have been silenced. And who are those people? Tend to be women, tend to be people of color, tend to be people with disabilities, tend to be sexual minorities. Uh, so that writing is the first step toward breaking the silence. And so in my young days, in my 20s, in my 30s, I was, I, in 30s and 40s, I was picketing. I was, I was, I was out there doing that. And I still do that some, but I find that at this point it's important to leave a record for the people who are coming behind. I think it's, I mean, I have been so um, pleased about the young people who say to me that learning about Pauly and uh, learning uh, about other aspects of Eleanor Roosevelt has given them courage. So I see telling these stories as a way of giving people examples uh, that embolden them, uh, as a way of showing them that they are not alone, that there, that there is a path, others have walked this way and that it can be done. So I see, I, at this point in my life, my writing has moved toward, uh, my activism has moved toward uh, uh, my own writing and, and I do journal writing, journal writing workshops with, I, I particularly like to do them with young people. Mm -hmm. uh, adolescents. Uh, so uh, that that's one of the things. And this summer when I took the workshop at IWWG uh, with uh, the incredible Kelly Dumar, um, I was just so excited because I see plays uh, as a way to reach people who may not necessarily be readers, but who would be um, emboldened and enriched by seeing an example of these characters. So I'm, I feel drawn toward that too. So I see working toward a play as, as movement toward reaching uh, a wider audience for purposes of social justice. You know, it always comes back to story, whether we're talking the oral story or the written story. It's that's what engages us, right? I mean, we are wired for story, as Lisa Crom says, and uh, I think it's um, it's a remarkable gift to be able to tell a story. It's a remarkable gift um, to be able to read a story or to, to watch a story unfold before you. But I think the maybe the other piece of it that I think you've also captured is that. Um, there's a there's a physical courage for being out on the on the um, out in the streets, you know, out on the barricades, but there is a moral courage that it takes to day after day after day after day um, sacrifice any kind of normalcy, if you will, to engage in the fight. And I think um, Polly's a wonderful example of that. You talk about the stress that she was under, the, um, the strain, the fact that she did have um, emotional issues around it, how not. Um, I can't help but wonder how much her own journal and her own letters to Eleanor, and I'm sure to others, um, helped her find the balance that she needed to be able to continue because she continued all the way until the end of her life. Absolutely, and she describes writing, the writing process was just important incredibly important to her. She describes writing as um, a way to find out what she thinks, as a way to find out what she already knows, to, as a way to find out what she needed to find out, as a, as a place of solace too. So that, and this is someone who wrote in multi-genre. She's known primarily as a poet, but she also wrote nonfiction, and she also wrote fiction. So um, it was it was central to her identity, and uh, she she was never caught without a pencil and pad. And so, uh, even when she was arrested one time in in Virginia for 
violating a state statute requiring her to sit in the back of the bus when she was jailed. Um, what she had with her, in addition to her clothes, but it was more important than her luggage, was her portable typewriter. <laughs> which she kept. She always kept pencil and paper. And then even by the time in her later life, when she became a priest, she she loved when knapsacks became popular. She didn't die until 1985. She loved being able to put all her writing utensils in her knapsack and, yeah. and put it over her shoulder and walk around. So she always had her, her pen and her pencil or, or her portable typewriter. What, what I was so delighted uh, to find out was that the woman who is the head of the Pauli Murray College at Yale Yale named a, a, a residential college in Polly's name this past fall. And the head of the college uh, posted on Facebook that someone had, someone recently allowed her to keep just temporarily one of Polly's portable typewriters. And so mm -hmm. she talked about what an inspiration it was to have that typewriter sitting in her office uh, because um, um, it, it was one of Polly's most important writing utensils. What a, what a wonderful story. That one gave me chills. <laughs> you know, um, I want to show everyone, first of all, your book. So if we can see that. And um, I want to encourage anyone who wants a really good read to pick it up. But Marge, do we have any questions or any comments from anyone? Hi, everybody. Um, no, no, no questions in the Q and A yet. So that may be a, a matter of feeling like Dixie is so good at what she's doing that you've got it covered. Oh, you're so good. Or <laughs> um, folks need to be reminded or directed to where the Q and A functionality might be on your screen, depending on the device you've logged in on. It might be at the bottom, the top, the left, the right. I don't know. If you move your mouse around, it'll pop up somewhere. So there's a Q and A in there. Um, if you're dying to ask a question and you can't find the Q and A, then go ahead and put it in the chat room, and we'll manage it from there. Great. Okay. Thank you. And it looks as though um, at least one person who's watching um, says that her parents actually knew and worked with the Roosevelts, and so this is particularly exciting for her to be able to listen to this interview. So they got around those two. <laughs> Oh, it, yes, they did. Yes, they did. It has been so exciting to give talks and to be places where some veterans stand up and uh, tell me that they met Eleanor Roosevelt. It, it's very clear that her presence um, and the way in which she interacted with people stay, would stay with them forever so that um, many feel as if that one moment uh, that she said hello to them and, and asked them how they were doing and are you getting the food you need? And she would always go to hospitals. So occasionally I've met, a, um, you know, and they're all dying off now, but um, met people who, to whom she paid a visit and they are just, they always speak about her with tears in their eyes. And you know, I think one of the things that we tend to forget is that, you know, given the time in which she lived, yes, Eleanor was a white woman. She came from an affluent family. She was, um, had a, an ancestry, the Daughters of the American Revolution, as you pointed out. And she had a real heart for social justice. She was the niece of a president. She was the wife of another president. And she was still a woman. And she was still limited in what she could do at that time. And I wonder if her own, um, I'm going to say it, lack of agency, because we don't think of her as lacking agency. But she was up against enormous odds in what she was trying to accomplish in her life as well. I wonder if that wasn't a point of connection between the two. It was, and, and there, I, I want to say a little bit more about the connection to them. Even though these, these two women came from very uh, different backgrounds, they had a lot in common. For example, starting with their names, they both shared the given name Anna. So Pauly was Anna Pauline Murray and Eleanor was Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. However, 
neither of them preferred Anna, so they used their middle names. They um, also were very similar in, uh, in childhood backgrounds except the economic part. They were both raised by elderly kin. They were orphaned as children. They both lost their parents. So they were raised by elderly kin. They grew up Episcopalian. They, um, they were both, um, they had tremendous energy. However, they also could suffer from low spirits. So I've already talked about Polly's, uh, mood swings, but Eleanor suffered from what we would now probably say was depression from time to time when she thought that she had been rejected or she had failed people who meant a lot to her. They both loved to read. They were voracious readers. They loved to write. They both loved poetry. They loved to read poetry aloud. They both loved dogs. And I'm a dog lover, so that really drew me in. Eleanor had a preference for Scottish Terriers, and Polly had a soft spot for strays, mostly large dogs. Uh, they both, and I think this is important, they both suffered social ridicule. Eleanor for her, for her protruding teeth, and Polly for her boyish fatigues, for, uh, boyish physique so that they both knew what it was like to be criticized and made fun of, of because of how you looked. They were both very talented women in a world that was controlled primarily by men. Eleanor um, really didn't want to be first lady. So when the president won, she was, she suffered an episode of depression because she had a job in New York. Uh, when I say job, not really being paid, but she, she was involved with a, a, a school for girls where she taught history and she was involved in administration. She loved that. She didn't want to give that up, but the president made it very clear that it would not be possible for her to go back and forth by train working in her school and, and being first lady. So she had to give that up. And it was because she had to give that up and wanted very much to create a life for herself that she ended up redefining what it means to be first lady. So it wasn't until Eleanor that we get a first lady who does all kinds of things that, that, it, that are atypical of what we typically think of as a first lady. She traveled more miles than any first lady had ever done. Wow, you know, um, oh, I noticed that there are some questions. Uh, so Marge, do you wanna come on? Sure, um, one is a content question, Pat, and one is a process question. Um, I'll ask them both, okay? Just for, for sake of efficiency. Um, first wanting to read that the process questions from Leslie Neustadt, who mentions in the chat room that Eleanor Roosevelt came to my house for dinner when I was 13. Wow. She, yeah. She responded to my eight-year-old sister's letter. She inspired me, and I'm also, I am so glad to hear about Polly and appreciate the relationship. This book is further confirmation of how amazing she was. Uh, Leslie's question is the process question. How did you keep on task for 20 years? <laughs> Amen. And, then, and then there are two more questions, Pat. Okay. Um, I just felt called to do this and I worried about whether or not I would get done because for the first, uh, for most of the first 10 years, I had a day job. I had my academic job and I had graduate students and dissertations and classes to teach. Uh, but what it meant was that I just made time. It meant getting up. I, you know, I had to be very disciplined. Um, I, th the story was so engaging and it was such a journey and such a mystery that I was really surprised by the time I turned the manuscript into my editor and I was working on the introduction. I had not finished the introduction. I was surprised when I totaled up the number of years and realized that it had been 20 years. I didn't think about it. I just kept going because I felt like 
I had to do this. I felt like I, I owed it to Polly. And so that was one of the things that kept me going. And I am, um, you know, I am a journal, journal keeper. So I would, I was always in conversation with myself about this. Um, I also am a bit of a pack rat. So I was always, I'm, and I'm pretty good at filing and keeping up with, with documents. Remember, I started out before, before you could do so much online. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I had a tremendous amount of paper to, to work through. So just the, just the calling of this, and I tell you what really, really um, made a difference is I happened to be going through a batch of letters that Polly wrote to a friend in 1972. And she said to this friend, a historian, that she was thinking about her biographer, this unnamed, unknown, and that she had begun putting, making notes for that person because she, her thought was that they might like to start her biography with um, the controversy about the University of North Carolina and the beginning of her friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt. I had already been, I had started working on that, oh, three or four years earlier. Didn't know that that was something that she had hoped that a biography would do, which said to me that that letter to me in 1983, 18 months before her death, was not a coincidence. So, um, so just knowing the feeling that I was fulfilling a wish just kept me going. She passed the baton on her own life to you, I think, um, you know, and you've been able to do for her what she didn't have the time to do for herself with everything else exactly. she was doing. Exactly. Yeah. And Marge, you said there were other questions? Yeah, three really good, really good questions. Uh, from Pamela Barconi, what do you think Pauli would be doing to counter the current political climate regarding racism, immigration, and women's rights? Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, I, think, I think she would be writing. I think she would be speaking. I think she would be lawyering. Uh, Polly was very active with American Civil Liberal ACLU, and it was in her work with the ACLU that she met the then law professor, Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg. And um, so I think that she would, she would be working with groups and she would be writing and she would be speaking out. I, I almost, um, it almost makes me fall down when I think about the weight of what she would be doing because see she did she, she has a huge correspondence it's one of the largest car collections of correspondence by an african-american woman in the country and her papers are are at harvard now and she was typing then now <laughs> with email and blogs I, i'm convinced that both she and eleanor would have blogs they would email i mean the 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 amount of um, work that they would put out would just just makes me the thought of it overwhelms me so they would both be very very busy but they would be speaking out okay. and they would be talking to to the to young people and i think Polly would would really be trying to impress upon people the importance of knowing the history as you move forward knowing what has come before knowing what the strategies have been before to address some of these issues because what we're going through is not unlike what I saw them dealing with. Eleanor spoke loudly um, against uh, discrimination against immigrants. She spoke loudly uh, against discrimination um, against people of color. So, um, and it, 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 you know, right now that gets lost sometimes particularly with the younger generation trying to work on those issues. I remember you mentioning in the book that um, she was absolutely appalled that Belafonte of all people, a native of New York, could not with his wife and his child move into affluent neighborhood because of segregation. And she was appalled and spoke out um, very vociferously about that. Yes, yes. Uh, Harry Belafonte and Eleanor Roosevelt became really good friends, and she was appalled that 
that uh, he could not rent uh, an apartment or buy an apartment in a particular apartment building. And she wrote about it in my day. The, the justice of that story is that he ended up buying the building. <laughs> he bought the building that they would not allow him to move in. But also what's also what's really important is Eleanor Roosevelt was so upset. She invited him and his family to move in with her. Oh my in gosh. Her apartment. And he told her, um, he thanked her, but he told her that he that moving in with her would mean that he was giving up the fight. So he continued to uh, to address the issue, and he did, ended up uh, purchasing the entire apartment building. I love it, boy. That's a get back. <laughs> Pat, you have a line in chapter fifty: discrimination. It's Eleanor's a quote from Eleanor: discrimination does something intangible and harmful. And in that chapter she references this not only to the people who are the target of discrimination, but to the people who perpetuate it. Can you speak to that? Eleanor felt and several of Pauli's um, long-term uh, white friends talk about the damaging, that the damage that discrimination does to the psyche and to the, what it does in terms of the distortion to one's self-esteem. It, it can lead the person who is the victim of discrimination into believing that they are somehow less than. But just as dangerous, uh, Eleanor felt, uh, was the notion that the person who is the perpetrator coming away from the experience or taking into the experience the notion that they are somehow superior. So, and, and her feeling was that you 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 lose yourself you have a distorted view of the world and that it dehumanize that everybody's dehumanized in this whole process so she um and this was really important when we think about the person that eleanor roosevelt became because for her unlike for some people during that time period who spoke out discrimination was a personal issue. She learned from listening to the stories of her close friends, from Harry Belafonte, from Polly Murray. She felt the pain. She saw how deeply hurt they were. So that when somebody mentioned the issue of housing discrimination, for Eleanor Roosevelt, it was real. It, was a re it wasn't abstract. It wasn't theoretical. She had seen the pain and the humiliation her close friends felt as a result of, of, of their treatment being denied. So that I think really um, allowed her to fight the, on these issues with a, a, a kind of integrity and an authenticity that many others didn't. They, they were good hearted uh, speaking from uh, positions of real compassion, but she could, and that's what people talk about when they talk about what they heard her say is you could, you knew that she felt it because she had learned vicariously from listening to her friends and watching how humiliated they had been by the experience. Which goes to show, I suppose, that, um, that the social justice, claiming that social justice platform can also be transformative to a person in ways that can be very unexpected. Because as you say, people can be very kind hearted and there can still be patronage attached to that and there can still be structural inequality attached to that. So yes. I could talk to you for about three more hours, but I am getting a little signal here that we are getting close to time out. And I think there's another question or two. Um, Mark, is that correct? Yeah, there's, there's a couple more, uh, Pat, and, and we actually warned Pat that we might hold her a little longer. We didn't let you attendees know that we anticipated going a smidge over and to hang on tight if you're going to be participating as a reader or a listener in the All Voices Open Mic. We're just going to stay on this same line, uh, and we want to honor your time too, but I think that you'll like uh, our asking Pat these two more questions followed by her letting us know where we can find out more about her and purchase her book. The questions are, Pat, one content, one process. 
in the book, this is from Tiffany Courtney, in the book you reference Pauli Murray's mental and or emotional health as simply, quote, health, unquote, issues, which I love because it's an important stance for women in removing this stigma. Can you share more on why you chose to use the simple term health? Could you repeat the last part of that again? Um, why you chose to use the simple term health mm -hmm. in referencing our mental and emotional health as simply mm -hmm. health issues, which no, um, that's just neutral. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, be, because Polly's condition was affected by um, her entire life circumstances. The issue was overall health. This was someone who, in living through, trying to, trying to make her way during the uh, depression and v at various times being literally homeless, malnourished. So there were these real um, conditions of deprivation. But then she also had a biochemical um, issue that had to do with a thyroid disorder. And then she also had the discrimination she faced because of sexual identity issues. So it, you had the convergence of all of these in her life. And I guess I'm not prioritizing any of them. I'm saying that the issue for her was overall health, uh, that all of them combined in such a way to challenge her. Now, what's remarkable is that despite all of that, she managed to make all kinds of contributions. Um, and many of the issues that she faced, which to, for which she did not get uh, adequate treatment were, were, had to do with the fact not only that she was female, that she was black, and that she was a sexual minority, but she was also a working class. And when we look at, and this was the another aside that I had to take some time to learn about, well, and that was the absence of, of um, uh, in, well, I already knew about the absence of inadequate care for all the various groups that Polly belonged to, but also the difficulty in, in getting treatment for uh, issues like, um, a thyroid disorder. Women in general, you know if we're talking 30s and 40s, that women who exhibited any kind of mood disorders were likely to be judged as hysterical. Right. And so Polly couldn't get the kind of diagnosis and treatment on, that she needed for that aspect of that health challenge until she was uh, in her in at midlife, it wasn't until then that it was discovered she had this disorder and that she had a partial thyroidectomy. So, um, I guess I would like to say that 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 her health challenges were complicated, and I I see them as a as a group as opposed to prioritizing any of them over the other. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love, I'm sorry, Pat, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, I, our, our final question, folks, um, before we learn where we can hear more about Pat and her book, where to find it. From Tori Dickinson, given all the intersecting social changes that were taking place when you wrote this book, how did you identify and focus on the main threads as you did all the archival research? <laughs> That's kind of a big question. <laughs> a huge question. Um, and I have to go back to my journals. Um, I have a wall full of journals and I kept tracking myself so that as I uh, visited one um, archive and went through the papers. Uh, I would come away with my impressions and my notes. And 
And I'm also, um, I would also create visual maps for myself on the wall so that I would have the themes and I would draw uh, links, dotted lines and straight lines between those various things. I, 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 I tried to map it. I kept, I, I tracked it in my journal. And as I said to you, I'm a, I'm an avid reader of mysteries. I had no preconceptions. So I just tried to follow where the, where they took me. So, um, you know, that, that's how I did it. I mean, and again, it, for me, it was an organic process. I just followed, followed where, the, where the road took me. You know, it's, it's kind of magical listening to you talk about this because I think all of us struggle to bring to fruition. I'm in the process now myself, um, you know, what we're writing. And this has been an amazing journey for you. It's been, um, I think Polly was reaching out with inspiration all the way from the grave there, um, and maybe Eleanor too. I noticed that Kelly just put a link onto the chat room um, so that people can get into Amazon to purchase your book. And I just want to thank you so very, very much for spending the time with us. I got to meet you when we were together in Kelly DeMar's class at the IWWG Summer Conference last summer. And I got to watch your, the beginnings of your play start to unfold. So I'm looking forward to when that one will come to fruition and we get to see it maybe staged at some point. That'll be an exciting moment. Well, I so enjoyed um, last year's conference and I have really enjoyed this webinar. This is the first one of this type that I have done and the questions have been fabulous. Um, Marge has just been incredible in setting, setting this up and getting us together. So this has been a wonderful experience. Well, thank you so very much. And Marge, I'm going to turn it back over to you because I know we're going to have um, open readings here shortly. And um, again, just thank you everyone for participating tonight, today, and uh, wherever you may be, 1 a.m. in Ghana, I understand. And um, hopefully we'll all be together again online soon. Excellent. Oh, I, I forgot to say my website. Oh, please do, yes. Uh, my website is www.patriciabellscottaltogether.com. You can find me on Facebook and you can find me on Twitter. Perfect. Come a long way from the days of that typewriter, huh? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> right there with you, Pat. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thank you, Pat. All right. Folks, I'm going to say good night to anyone who uh, was here just for Pat's interview with Dixie. Um, I'm also going to stop the recording. And uh,